hope you all are enjoying the war, the conference, its last two talks, so you can keep breeze and soon it will be over. There will be one more food most probably. You should be lucky about it. Um, the conference is about Angular and technologies, but what is technology without architecture? And I will try to speak about it from some kind of abstract, because uh, I'm already six years starting maybe from version one of AngularJS uh, with that team. So basically I'm stuck not only to the Angular or technology. I love the team, the core team, who is behind the Angular. I love their approaches. But I will try to disable my Angular fanboy part and to speak more kind of abstractful, to speak about why a software architect should choose Angular. The controversial part about this thought that um, if software architect starts to speak with you with a phrase, we will use Postgres or we will use MySQL or we will use Angular, it's not yet software architect. It's a developer. In my opinion, uh, we'll get to this, but in my opinion, software architect should be more abstract level and to think about the solution in general. As for me, this is my avatar. I have several products I'm working on. One of those is Valor Software, as you can guess. Uh, and GX Bootstrap, as several times was mentioned by Zachary, thank you so much. And I need to work on this microphone, I suppose. Uh, this year, uh, as I said several times again, I learned that I became Google Developer Expert. Uh, as you can see, I'm working on Ninja Talks now. And my handle, where you can find me in GitHub, Twitter, Facebook, and other social medias. And this is not going to be another talk about Angular versus some kind of other framework. We are not going to speak about that thing. We won't speak about server-side rendering, or lazy loading, or change detection, or um, Angular version 6 is the fastest one. I know I actually did it. So Angular 6 is the fastest rendering framework at the moment, according to JavaScript benchmark performance. But I'm saying that rendering, in terms of memory usage, Angular still has too much things which is doing on the bootstrap page. So basically, we hope it will be fixed in Ivy render, but we will not speak about it. So the question is, I would, I would have on your place what you're actually doing on the talk, because we are on Angular conference, and dude came to the stage and saying, mm, you know, we will not speak about Angular, let's move on. So, first question to you, how do you choose the framework you will work on the next project? Home project, you know, work project, big project, small project. How did you make a decision? Usually, you can ask somewhere you believe some, somehow more experience than you. You at least believe this person is, has more knowledge about those things. Or you go into some kind of social media or, um, you know, person is famous like Dan Abramo, for example, or, uh, I don't know, Martin Fabler, or who you believe is a famous developer or architect in, you know, our industry, and to listen to his advice or her advice about what to choose. Or you're reading frameworks comparisons. Here's plus, minus, what it's going to be, what I'm going to answer. But anyway, you are listening to some kind of a human who believes he is good enough to judge. And here thinks that he has an authority or an idea to pursue you to apply his opinion. But be really, really careful about it. Because this is the thing I'm always trying to catch my hand on, that even if you have an authority, you work in this area for a lot of many years, you always should remember that authority and arrogance are close together. When you became overconfident, you do mistakes. Because you don't see the road underneath your, you know, legs. And you will respect my authority because I'm trying to impress you and, you know, say why you should choose an Angular. According to Wikipedia, software architect is an expert who makes a high level design choices and dictates technical standards, coding standards, tools, platforms to use. 
I am software uh, architect, I can dictate the things. I would love my team to use that. Um, in this part, software architect is a developer. Clearly see that when developer became really good experts, he became a software architect who decides the fate of the whole product. Why we did not take into account other folks on the team, like QAs, DevOps, managers, users, customers, after all, who pay our money to develop their products. Why we are keeping their opinion and their vision of the things, how product should behave and how it should be you know, developed. So, architecture, what is this all about? What the thing, what we do mean when we say architecture? What makes architecture good or bad? I have no idea. Most probably frameworks. Next Angular, next few, 150 React, maybe, who cares? Question is, when we spoke about previous slide, and there was customers, and users, and the Angular kid, and he really doesn't care about the framework you use. Really? So when you open like website, uh, you start to click through it, you see some things, but if it works, do you care what was used to write it? No. You care only about it works or it doesn't work. Or it could be really slow, then it's PHP. That's it. So all architecture is about product, not about frameworks, not about tools. It's about product. When we say product, it's actually a set of requirements. And you know this kind of classic thing about requirements. There could be more requirements, less requirements, more visions. But at the end, all requirements could be divided in two main groups. There could be functional requirements and non-functional requirements. So I will pay attention to just a part of those. I will explain later why on that part. And for first functional requirements, we care about this is business rules. This is what customers tell us how it should behave. And this one in particular should not affect your you know, decisions about the frameworks in one thing. But when you go to the architecture and you start to draw the diagrams, you will figure out that there are one question you will ask yourself. It's how easy to decouple your business rules from representation. It could be not UI, it could be a API, but it's always a question. How hard your business rules implementation is coupled to your source code? How hard it's coupled to your framework? Can you extract those business rules and use them somewhere else? It's a good question to remember. Other important part is external interfaces. Uh, and here we'll get back to the Angular fanboy. And when, you, when I was interviewing developers like maybe four, three, four years ago, uh, please be honest, who know what is interfaces and abstract classes? <laughs> who knew what it is four years ago before Angular? <laughs> Left, e did you knew it as a front-end developer or as a back-end developer? <laughs> Tricky question. This is business rules. OK, if you were just a front-end developer and you knew about interfaces and abstract classes four years ago, pick your hand up. Let's match. Oh? I knew it from Java. Sure, from Java, but it's not from front-end. So basically, Angular brought TypeScript to and made it popular. And with TypeScript, it brought interfaces and abstract classes. So now, when I ask in somebody on an interview, what is contract? What is our communication interface? He don't like blinking with his eyes, what is it going to put interface? It's JavaScript, it doesn't have interfaces. No, now we can speak and use the terms uh, which object-oriented programmers was using for decades. And it's kind of a good thing. And when, you, when we speak about external interfaces as part of functional requirements, there are always a question, how hard is to define communication contract? Basically interface between parts of your application or between 
your front end or back end, which are basically parts to, or other way to split your application. And there are thing which bothers all of us, I just put it here because we will not speak about it. But when you see functional requirement to pop up like, yes, we have a hoopies, yes, GDPR, yes, I want to give you my location, no, and no more push notification. Yesterday I was opening inside, he doesn't understand the word no, so he was asking me uh, for uh, my location like maybe 20 times, and then just it's crushed, thanks God, because I wasn't able to close it. And the, my favorite, my personal favorite thing about functional requirements, it must work. It's really a matrix. When you do architecture matrix of your functional requirements, it should be measurable. And one of those requirements, your architecture application should work. That's good. You can do it. And most interesting, as for me, part is no functional requirements. So basically, what it says about like. When we started, like, you know, it's classic, but again, uh, <laughs> software architect uh, dictates coding rules. So basically, software architect could say to you that you should use double tabs. Who would agree to work on that project? Huh? Double tabs, you know, not four spaces, not two spaces, but tab, tab, to, you know, he love big things, you know. It's like to buy, you know, yellow hammer. And our favorite as developers, metrics, performance. This is where we love our rulers, yeah? And there are so much metrics. Time to first buy, to first interaction, to the name of the screen, to the icon. Uh, there are even patterns to measure the performance. Question to all of us. It's developer metrics. Yes, I agree that performance is not important. Uh, what is user metrics for performance? Would you agree if, you know, as for user, I have three parts of the metrics. It's like instant up, just load it, you know, just open it and load it, especially on Wi-Fi. Uh, it's good enough when you open website, it shows something and then images loaded, like, okay, computer thinking, it's fine. And I will use another site. As for a user, this is three typical measures for performance. Question is a statement, just a statement that 90% of time spent to accomplish the performance metrics, there are a lot of them, uh, will take 10% of your time. To make your website instant, like you know, service side rendering to add some, or you're trying to convert all of your application to uh, HTTP slash two, or you're trying to do some crazy things, you know, like minimize images, and line up the things like. Uh, guess what a user will use, and you spend like 90% of the time in one metric, and user simply doesn't care. What it says about us as developers, it says that we develop and we do invest in this time, which customer is paying for, to fulfill our ego. No, it's not really funny actually, because if it's good enough or it's fast, even if fast, you don't need to make it instant. You could have other non-functional requirements, like when you speak that uh, Google indexing bot should be able to read our metadata, yeah, to index your website. What does that mean? It's that you need to pre-render metadata on your pages, not the whole pages with images, where you'll spend a lot of time implementing. So, when you, and when you start to go in further in this metric, you spend more time, but you don't feel, fulfill any requirements except requirements of your ego. And it doesn't good speak about anything good about us as developers. And of course, customer metrics, um, will it earn you some money or not? That's it. Other part of our teams, hopefully, as, as for me, without QAs, uh, uh, I heard from one person that he always writes a perfect code without any issues, but he does not work with us anymore. <laughs> so, yeah, it happens. Uh, without testers, without QA, I would rather say uh, software engineers and testing, 
if to full, fully, you know, have respect to this profession, because it's all other part of theory, how to break your code. They learn it. They want to make us feel bad about our code. But it gives us some kind of a confidence that customer will not f make feel as bad. And the fun fact about the stability that test does not prove your application is a bug free. Tests prove that you couldn't break it by your tests. Why the stability is important? There are you know, there are this ice cream cake, yeah. There are end to end tests, there are unit tests, there are snapshot testing which come and go for the last fifteen years. There are a lot of other things and techniques and manual testing and all of that just to prove that we cannot break our application. The bad part is when not you, not your product dictates you and your you know, architecture how you should do it because you have requirements and you need technology which will allow you to implement your product. You don't need a technology which dictates you how to test it. And I don't mean implementation of how to test it. I mean when technology or framework or library says to you that you should not do unit tests. You should do snapshot testing. You should not do snapshot testing. You should end-to-end -end tests. Got my idea. So when you do software architecture, you think about product first. You think about functional and functional requirement. You should not think about technology which will limit you. You should find a technology which fulfills your requirements, not vice versa. Yeah, classic. <laughs> Maintainability. I love classic. I'm old. Um, Maintainability. What does that mean for us as the developers? It's a non-functional requirement. I don't mean those uh, people, I cannot find your eyes right now, but we spoke about first with a person who's trying to merge the product, still supports Delphi. In other words, I, don't, I cannot find the proper words. I'm really sorry about it, really, unfortunately. <laughs> Who's basically using AngularJS still? Nobody? Oh, you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but again, when we speak about maintainability as a request, because any application you do, as is dead, at the same moment, you stopped to support it. As soon as the application is stopped to evolve, it's dead. It's our life, it's our market, and it moves fast. Requirements change all the time. If we could not maintain our solution, it's dead. That simple. What will help us to maintain the project better? When developers does not break or cross boundaries we draw on our architecture map. While developers fulfill our solution, which we like, you may think or draw it somehow, it will work. As soon as they cross the boundaries, because they could not fulfill your architecture approach, because their platform they choose to develop implementation details, are limiting them and it does not allow them to implement the approach you develop for a product. Question to you, does this kind of um, platform which limits your developers and restricts, gives restrictions to software architecture, is it proper solution for your product if it's not allowing to develop the thing you think it really will be great and will solve the you know, customer and user problem? Other thing is scalability. Like my ear is not scalable enough. Uh, on UI, problem of scalability does not mean anything for you, alright? No, mm, right, no person. This is kind of about lazy loading. So when you have an application, forgive me for that. Uh, when you have an application and it was a proof of concept or MVP, and then you need to add 20 more pages. Yeah, if it's easy to do with any current framework, it's easy to do. Question is, uh, how hard with framework of your or you know platform library or something you choose? How hard to scale it without damaging the initial solution? How easy to add additional parts of implementation without 
making that the initial load time for our favorite performance metrics. It's about this loading mostly. I can speak about it for a long, long time because there are, this is a small, most noticeable uh, wallet attributes on the market. Uh, in general, they divide like 300 non functional requirements we can speak about in the next slide. But we will move to the other part, which leads us to some kind of a conclusion. Wait for it a bit, like five minutes more. Uh, there are a layered architecture. There are several most popular uh, architecture patterns which are used in the market. One of those is a layered architecture. What does that mean? It's basically MVC. Thing about MVC is about boundaries. What is good for? It gives us separation of concerns and separation of concepts. Uh, what do you think? Is it's question without answer just to think about. If technology says to you that you should mix your concerns, mix your concepts, mix your layers together, will it be a good solution architecture-wise or bad? Guess what I'm thinking about? Like PHP views in GS, I will say about later. Uh, of course, if it's layered, it's maintainable again if developers does not break the boundaries. It's testable for a reason, because you already split two independent parts. And it's easily enhanceable, because you can add additional views, additional models, and so on and so on. That's interesting. Uh, event driven architecture for you folks. What it is? You know what it is? Who knows what is event driven architecture? Who uses Jurix? Or some kind of. Who uses RxJS? Why didn't you read documentation? <laughs> So, event-driven architecture basically is an approach which allows you to adopt to something kind of chaotic behavior. Like, uh, best tester is grand user, yeah? So it's kind of, and your application could survive such behavior and such, add such attitude to your application. Doesn't matter how much he clicks if you use event architecture, you're always ready for that kind of stuff. It's easy to scale and it's easy to extend. Because what you need to do in this architecture if you add in one more button? You need to add one more event type and one more handler for this event type. A basic actions reducers may be effects if you have side effects. Even for what? So this is what we'll talk about. Rooks, GS, and GX, and GXS. There are one more things. Um, if you're watching this, forgive me. I forgot the name. Uh, I prepared these names. But not Redux. The worst part is current developers we are trying to follow the upper part of the information. So we can skip documentation, uh, we can skip design partners. We have so nice tools and frameworks which allows us to build websites, applications, single page application, web application, and doesn't, we don't have to look inside of it because we have style guides, best practices available for a particular framework and we don't have to think about what is underneath, what kind of idea was behind this, this part. And I, have a, I see a lot of confusion about the Redux pattern. There are no such thing as Redux pattern, please. There are common query separation principles. There are common query resource segregation paradigm. There are even sourcing, common sourcing. There are a lot of things behind of that. So Redux is implementation of one of those, but it was done initially for uh, the library, which initially was synchronous one. And Redux is a synchronous thing which tries to live an even, uh, even driven world. So this is why they're trying to change, but they don't want to apply RxJS because it will be just one more in Jurix. A uh, popular thing which is called microservices, not really applicable to our conference, but the joke about Nana Macro or SOAP again. Who knows what is SOAP uh, architecture? You know the pain. Uh, I will surprise you, but uh, right now, like modern hype again about service driven development, if you've heard about it. And they're going back to the SOAP. My congratulations to everybody who was working and developing like 20 years ago. History repeats itself. And we will face a lot of developers saying and screaming about the soft architecture is so good. That, away from it. Important thing 
for all of those implementation, for those uh, architectures patterns. When you do an architecture, you should be able to decouple the control flow, which function calls another function, uh, from direction of control. One thing that your UI is calling the backend, it's fine, it could be long pulling, but what is really happened from the point of view of architecture, that backend sends something to the UI. And it's controversial, because in the direction of control, it's the front end calling the back end. But on your architecture level, it will be server sending the notifications to the UI. And those, those directions should not be linked to each other. You should be able to split those. They should not affect your vision of your product. So the main question is, uh, why I was asking about interfaces, abstract classes, I could ask front-end developers about things like, now you know what is event-driven architecture, and you use it. Uh, now you know what is dependency injection, because you're an Angular conference and you use it. You know, what's, you know what is MVC, and you know, maybe you don't like, use that it's anterior architecture, but you already knew it. You had to figure it out to work on your framework. Uh, you know what is interfaces and abstract classes. You know a lot of approaches, you know what is inheritance, what is extended interface and all of that things. You know about contracts. So, in my opinion, that software architect is not dictates. Software architect is responsible for. And it is his responsibility to select the proper framework or library or solution for a product. But it all depends on the product you're developing. As for me, you know what kind of a platform I choose for a reason. But main pro my main product from all of that list was not the projects I'm developing now. I left manufacturing on um, outsourcing to build my manufacturing. This is another idea. And my product, my main product is Valor Software. Uh, let's try to apply software architecture things I mentioned to here. I wanted to be to be that my teams became maintainable, so they would be able to help each other. If somebody is missing, they can help each other. They can fulfill each other's idea. Uh, team is scalable because they all are working on one platform, and they can teach other folks who come in. Uh, Layered architecture is not good. I prefer event driven if something crap happens, we react. Uh, Angular, sorry. Um, what it is more. But the main thing for it was uh, I don't have to dictate any kind of technical things heavily, but we use a platform which uh, forces developers to learn. You cannot survive Angular development without learning the basics. For some sites say that it's a bad part. As for me, for my product, when platform allows you to do anything and it forces for best practices, it forces you to learn what is dependency injection, what is event-driven architecture, it forces you to empty your architecture things, understanding of those, not just using and implementing but understanding of those. And think about it. What you have learned for real, you was learning not only Angular platform, you was learning how to become a better developer. And other part I really love about Angular core team. Uh, when I said about authority and ego, yeah? What the, what the things they say about Angular? Angular is about love and about sharing the knowledge. This is what we are here for. This is what we are doing. We are getting some knowledge. Uh, most of the speakers nervous to the sh is it get out? Uh, really nervous before speaking, but they're still going on the stage and trying to share what they have figured out, to share the things. And I uh, hopefully you will enjoy the conference and you have seen how friendful each other, like speakers, how they introduce each other, how they speak with you, and how it was going.
So this is kind of why I'm speaking about conference, because again, it's my product. And I was applying the same non-functional functional requirements to its implementation. Thank you for your attention.